Amen. Praise God. I have, before we get started here, before, uh, I have notes, like five pages, I think. But I didn't staple them, but they are collated. Thank God for modern technology. So if you'd like a copy of those, you would have the outline of what I'm going to try to teach tonight. We're going to like take a drink out of a fire hydrant tonight is what we're going to do. Is <laughs> so you pray for me. I have to stay with these notes because if I don't, I will never be able to get this in a, in a time. So keep in mind as we get started here, you know, this is an introduction. It's for new believers. So we're going to stay basic and stay simple. I think simple is a good thing. I think Jesus taught simply, profound, but profoundly simple. Amen? Amen. So, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of times I've left places and, and people go, wow, that was deep. And I said, well, what did he say? They said, I didn't get it. That's why I know it was deep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how deep it is. If you don't get it, it's not something wrong, something wrong. So uh, you bear with me and uh, pray for me and, you know, we're going to stay, try to stay with these notes and, and uh, as we record this, though, you feel free to, uh, we, won't, we won't stop for questions or uh, maybe at the end when we're done, get in the recording and all that done, but, but uh, we'll just see what the Lord has. I prayed a lot about this and prayed over it, prayed and had to wade through much uh, material to get this down. And, and um, I, all I can say is there will be, well, my, my goal after doing this was, well, we could, we could do some follow-up and, and some delve into some specifics. All right, so you ready, Kevin? Here we go. Tonight we're going to uh, talk about the fivefold ministry as a part of this discipleship course. And as we delve into it tonight, we're going to begin and give an overview of spiritual gifts so that we can put this in the context of what God wants to do in the church today. Now, while we're going to delve specifically into the fivefold ministry, um, we need to establish the fact overall of the gifts of the Spirit and their relevancy within the church today. There is an element within the church that believe the gifts of the Spirit are not necessary anymore. They cite Paul's writing in Corinthians that the gifts would cease when that which is perfect uh, comes, speaking about the Bible in its complete form. And you find that in 1 Corinthians 13. However, in the next very chapter, Paul exhorts the church at Corinth to seek the gifts. He encourages and exhorts them to all seek to prophesy. He exhorts and encourages them to pray in the Spirit and pray in tongues. He exhorts them to do all the things that an element of people would like to say has ceased or there's no need for it. But when you study the gifts and you realize what God is doing within the church today in the realm of spiritual gifts, we, you really realize how important these gifts are to the church and its mission. It's imperative that we stay in and on the Word of God because your subjective experience must always come under the scrutiny of the Bible. Any experience outside of the Word of God will not stand the test of authenticity. We do not judge the Word by our experiences. We judge our experiences by the Word of God. Amen. In the Word of God, in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, I'd like to read this portion of Scripture that John wrote. Uh, uh, by the way, an apostle who moved and functioned in the gifts and loved Jesus with all of his heart and he loved the church. He said, Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but prove or test the spirits to discover whether they proceed from God. 
For many false prophets have gone forth into the world. By this you may know, perceive, and recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit which acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus Christ the Messiah actually has become man and has come in the flesh is of God, has God for its source. And every spirit which does not acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh but would annul, destroy, sever, disunite him is not of God nor does not proceed from him. This non-confession is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you heard that it was coming and now it is already in the world. Any pursuit that supplants our pursuit of Jesus is a trick of the enemy. One of the biggest stumbling blocks in the church today in this area of the gifts is that we can actually put the gifts over the giver and fall into error. But we're not seeking just a gift tonight nor an understanding of just the gifts. We want to know how the gifts play into the very heart of the Savior and how the message of Christ is intricately woven into the gifts and how the manifestation of the gifts is in fact the ministry of Jesus on the earth today. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 7, we're going to take a brief look at these gifts and break them up into, into a, a categorical study just for understanding. And then we're going to take one of those categories and we're going to spend our time on it tonight. Verse 1 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Now what Paul's saying here is he introduces the subject of spiritual gifts is he's acknowledging that there is a spirit realm. And within the spirit realm, there's the spirit of God and there's the spirit of, of the enemy. And you can come under the influence of the spirit of God. And when you're under the influence of the spirit of God, then you are being controlled or being ministered in and through the spirit of God. That's that's what he's saying, because on the other side of this, he says, we know there's a, there is a demonic realm. And he reminds them that when they were Gentiles and they were worshiping idols, they were the, under the influence of a whole nother spirit. And under the influence of an evil spirit, they were led, they were, they were, being, they were, they were being influenced. And so what Paul's saying is we need to acknowledge that there is an existence of a spiritual realm. A lot of people want to deny the existence. But we know, we know there's an existence of a God realm, a spiritual realm where God and the Holy Spirit is in control. And where there's an, a spirit and a realm of the demonic. And where, the, where, where Satan himself tries to influence or lead people. Now listen to what he says in verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So again, he's talking about a man under the influence. A man under the influence of the Spirit of God is going to have the right perspective, the right acknowledgement, the right confession, the right things are going to come out of him because he's being led or being controlled by the Holy Ghost. Now he says in verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So you see, now he gets into the realm of spiritual gifts, talking to the Corinthians who needed instruction. And he says that in the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man 
to profit with all. Verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. Him being put on display is what the word manifestation means. When something is manifested, it's put on display. And so when God puts His Spirit in a man, He does it so that Spirit can be put to work and put on display in a person's life. Why? So that all can profit from it. When you are used by God, people are blessed and built up and edified and encouraged and strengthened. In fact, the only way that we can really do spiritual work is by and through the Holy Spirit. The only way that we can really touch a person and, and really effectively minister to them is when we are letting the Holy Spirit use us in a supernatural way. Because we know it's not of man, it is of God. So we recognize that this manifestation of the Spirit is given to just a few select gifted people, right? No, it, it, I, I, that's not what it says. It's given to every man to profit everybody. So here's a gold mine of teaching right here on the gifts, which we could park here tonight and, and spend the rest of our time. But I've got, to, I've got to move along here. What I want to do, though, is show you the presence of the three categories as I present the gifts. This is how... Um, I believe Paul put it in this particular portion of Scripture. First of all, you notice the presence of the Trinity. There is the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, if you look at that, verse 4, there are differences of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And the same God, the Father, who works all in all. So you see Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see three different categories of gifts as he lists them. First of all, he lists the diversities of gifts. This word gifts in verse 4 is the word charisma. It's the word for a grace gift. It's a gift given to come upon a man that is given and under the control of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, you see... Under verse 5, there are difference of, differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Administrations represents ministries, or what we're going to address tonight out of Ephesians, the fivefold ministry. You see, the church belongs to Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Jesus came to this earth, we know, and primarily people get stuck in the idea and the concept that Jesus only came to die for man's sins, to be resurrected and go back to heaven. But if you look in the 17th chapter of John, Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer. And Jesus says to the Father, he says, Father, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And I've read that and I said, well, wait a minute. He hasn't been to the cross. He hasn't been resurrected yet. And yet he's praying and he's saying, Father, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And as you see the prayer of John 17 in context, you realize what work that Jesus is talking about is the calling out of these select people, the ecclesia, those who are called out, the church, Jesus, before he went to the cross, before he was resurrected, called whom he would, and he set them in their place and organized his church and called them mine. That's really powerful. We don't have time to shout, but we, that'd be a good spot right there if we had time to shout. But you see, in the, in the establishment of the church, Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the one who is building his body. And his desire is that there be the manifestation of these administrations, which are the ministry or the fivefold gifts. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Then, verse 6, we see the Father who works, the same God who works all in all. 
And he uses that in the word operations. Which the word operations is the word energema, where we get our word energized from. And they're what, what are commonly called the motivational gifts. You find the motivational gifts in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. They're the gifts of prophets, serving, um, a, a giver, mercy. There are seven different gifts listed there that we call the motivational gifts. They're, they're something that God puts within every person. And, and, it, and it's the main energizing of that person's life. And I'll explain that more in a moment. Then we know the nine spiritual gifts are found in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. The word of knowledge, uh, the, word, uh, uh, the word of wisdom, the discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues, healings, miracles, pr prophecy. And in Ephesians chapter 4, where we're going to go tonight... In fact, if you would, go to Ephesians chapter 4 with me now. And tonight's focus is on the five-fold ministry. Now verse 7 in Ephesians 4 says this, But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So now listen to me. Every one of us have been given the gifts to be used by God and for God to be able to manifest His presence, His power in our lives. There had been a common thought that had run through uh, the body years ago that, that, um, you know, that we possessed those gifts. Like, for example, there were there were individuals who said they had the gift of healing. And, and, you know, and I know people were used by God and, ha and are still being used by God in the realm of healings. But think about it like this. Why would you limit yourself to one gift when the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you, who has all nine gifts at his disposal, and that at any moment, you in a yielded posture, he can use you through any one of those nine gifts. I had someone come to me and they said, Pastor Mike, what do you think is the best of the nine spiritual gifts? That was a good question. I had to think about that one. Because I'm going through my mind. What is the best of the nine spiritual gifts? Healings, miracles, word of wisdom. Word of knowledge, prophecy. I mean, that's a, there's a good list there of nine spiritual gifts. But as I thought about it, my answer to this person was that the best spiritual gift is the one that's needed at the time. And so when we, instead of thinking that we own the gifts, we should think in terms of the Holy Spirit owning us and that the availability of those gifts are at our disposal as the Spirit wills. Why would you, you know, as people come to say, Pastor Mike, how many spiritual gifts do you have? I say, nine. <laughs> nine? Woo! Well, that's, that's how I see it being presented. That those gifts are available and the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, here's what Paul says in Ephesians verse 8, 4 verse 8. Every one of us is given grace to operate in the gifts. Wherefore he says, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now Paul, though, is going to change gears. Because now he's went from the word gift as in charisma, but the Greek word here changes. You see, you don't get this in the English version of the New Testament. But now he uses the Greek word doma, D-O-M-A. 
And actually a better rendering of this verse is that he gave men as gifts. Okay, I'll let that sink in. And, we, and God is not a, God is not a, uh, a, a sexist. What, what do you call that? A, he, he doesn't discriminate against women. He just uses generic terms here. God gives gifts to women too. And he makes women gifts to the body. And, and we hopefully we'll get there tonight too. But he says in verse 9, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Again, now he's now Paul's going into the into the real elements of the of the work of Christ, the unseen part of what you know everybody saw Jesus crucified that day. But the part that the real powerful part of the of the death of Christ is when that he was crucified, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Peter talks about this further, and I don't have time to get in it tonight because it's, a, it's something that would take a whole lesson in and of itself. But it talks about how he preached to the captives. And he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, here's what Paul says in this. In this when Jesus descended in the lower parts of the earth, he that descended is the same also that ascended. See, when Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth, it had behind it in its mind how he was going to release captivity, but also that he was not just going to release the captives, but he was going to give gifts unto men. Because in the ascension part of it, Jesus was the embodiment of the fivefold ministry. Let me submit it to you like this. In Hebrews, we find Jesus is called the Apostle. In Revelation, Jesus is referred to as a prophet. In John, Jesus is a shepherd or a pastor. In the book of Peter, he's, he is referred to as a teacher. In the Gospels, numerous places... He is the evangelist. Jesus within himself embodied the fullness of all five of these ministries. The apostle, the prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Okay, are you with me? Now, he listen to how he puts the, you got to see this. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. So in Jesus filling his office and fulfilling his role in, in coming to this earth to show us what an apostle looks like, to show us what a prophet looks like and what a prophet does and what an apostle does and what evangelists do and what pastors and teachers should all be about because we should model our ministries after him. I know we go to seminaries to learn how to be ministers, but really what we need more than a seminary is an encounter with Jesus that will impart to us the anointing that was on him to do what he did. And so as a young believer, you're, you're wondering, well, should I go to Bible school? And, and I, I certainly wouldn't discourage anyone from going to Bible school. You're saying, should I go to seminary? Because I would never, I would never discourage you from going to seminary if that's your, in your heart. We say, well, should I go to this internship or should I take this or should I do this? And, and yet the question's not asked. How do I find my place in this life of Jesus? And here's what Paul said. He Wants to fill all things. And verse 11 then he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So we see in the filling of all things, Jesus' desire was to set in order his ministry within the church. So what he did is he says, I'm going to call some to this position or this ministry of apostle, some to prophet, 
some to evangelist, some to pastor, and some to teach. Now look at what he says, verse 12. Why would he do this? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now for years, I have to admit, I read this verse completely wrong. Because as someone who felt the call to ministry early in my, in my life, and, and in answering that call, when I read this verse, I read it as this, these people, whoever that they are and whoever that they would call, had a threefold ministry. Here's how I read it. They were going to perfect the saints, they were going to work the ministry, and they were going to edify the body of Christ. In fact, that's how many even teach it. But then I got a revelation in this, and I saw that that is, not, that is exactly opposite of what the heart and the desire of Jesus was. That he gave this fivefold ministry, and in the unfolding of the fivefold ministry, it was for the reason that they could help grow the saints up. That's what that word perfecting there means. Don't let that word scare you because in our terms of perfecting, you know, we think of something is perfect that's without flaw, but actually the word perfect means it has come to its fullness. It's come to its purpose, and, and, and it's come to its reason for being. So when the, when the fivefold ministry is functioning, the saints come into wholeness. They come into their place. They come into their uh, uh, their position in Christ and, and, and what happens is they grow up into him and as a result of the saints growing up into him what happens is ministry comes from these saints the whole idea and the purpose of God was never to create a ministry hierarchy like we have today which came right out of the pits of hell because it was never Never in the heart of God to limit ministry to a man with credentials who was a professional, who, who went to, for special training and says, I'm trained to do this. Always in the heart of God, it was meant that his, his church, his ecclesia, his called out ones are called for the purpose of ministry. You have been called to minister. And when you... Come into your, your, your calling, your completeness, your fullness in Jesus. What you're going to find as he puts this in you, ministry comes out of you. And then as, as a result of the ministry that comes out of you, what happens? It says here that the body of Christ is edified or built up. The body of Christ is added to. When you fulfill your calling in ministry, the people are saved. People are encouraged, people are strengthened, people are delivered, people are set free. In other words, the body of Christ gets blessed because you're functioning in what you have been called to do. God has called the church to a body life, that, that all this ministry should be taking place within the life of the body. It's not restricted to four walls within a church. God meant this to happen in the streets, in the marketplace, at Walmart, at, at Applebee's. Wherever you find yourself, you find yourself open to God and the gifts will begin to operate through you and you will see yourself edifying, building up, reaching the lost, ministering to people because that's what God has called the church to do. But one of the biggest oppositions or stumbling blocks to the church being released into this is the fact that within even the fivefold ministry, we have put a lid on people. I'm trying to stay with my notes here. Now pray for me. Look at verse 13. He said, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. So how, you know, for those who are cessationists, who believe that the gifts passed with the, with the New Testament or that there's no need for the gifts or no need for fivefold ministry or the day of the apostles is over when, when the last apostle died and so on and so forth, that is contrary to what verse 12 teaches. He teaches that the ministry was, would be here and would continue to work until the saints come into this completion and that till we all come into this unity of faith. 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a complete man, a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all are like Jesus. Because once we, the church becomes like Jesus, and the church is walking in the authority of Jesus, and the church reflects the very heart and nature of Jesus, when the church is brought into that perfect man, that Paul wrote about in Colossians and Ephesians, Corinthians and Romans, when the manifestation of the sons of God comes into its fullness, then we know the church has a destiny and a date with God called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the church finishes its job. And then we could say, I guess there'd be no, there's no more need for that fivefold ministry once the church reaches that perfection. There will be no more need for those gifts because we'll, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. But we're not there yet. We haven't arrived yet, so the ministry is still given. The gifts are still operating. God is still calling the church to come into a unity of the faith. But yet that is one of the most lacking elements within the body of Christ today. We have set lines of demarcation. We have, we have set ourselves behind our belief systems. We are hiding from one another, separating from one another. We have pulled away from one another. And the passion of my heart is to call the church back to unity because Jesus prayed, Father, that they all may be one as I am in you and you are in me. And we cannot allow the walls to continue and the things to separate us, keep us apart from each other because it is hindering the very purpose and the work of God on the earth today. God has called the church to come back to him. And the more we get closer to him, the closer we are going to have to get to one another. We're going to have to decide, it's okay if you believe this and I believe this. Because ultimately, it's Jesus that makes the difference. It's Jesus that we stand together in. I don't, you don't have to look like me, talk like me, believe like me. But you do have to stand beside me and walk this walk in him if you're going to please the Lord. So listen to what he says. He says well, this is going to happen that we're henceforth no more children. Well, that's a problem because that means there's a lot of childish, childishness going on within the body today. We're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, carried away, isolating ourselves away by the slight of men, by cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, you know, I was thinking about this this morning as, you know, in, in an addendum here because I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it have been so much easier if Jesus would have, you know, when he came, he embodied all the fivefold ministry. And so wouldn't it have been so much it, it easier if Jesus would have just bestowed all five of those gifts within a handful of individuals? Obviously not because that would have never worked. Why would God separate these gifts and then give them to different people because it means we have to work together <laughs> so he says verse 15 speaking the truth in love will grow up into him into all things which is the head even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together fitly joined together See, that's what God is trying to speak to the body of Christ today. That it's time to bring the body back together. I was thinking I would love to, I, I would love to have brought a mannequin within me, with me tonight. And, uh, except I didn't know, I, you know, they cost like $1,500. And nobody trusted me enough to let me have one. And I wanted to take that mannequin and I wanted to take it in pieces and Put the head over here and the arm over there and the leg over here and the, and, and the trunk of his body back here. And then, it's, and then it's show you for illustration's sake, that's exactly where the church is today. And that's why it's hard to get much done, really, in a real powerful, effective way. But just think what happens when the body comes together and gets fitly joined together. Just think of the power of the body that is brought together in unity and grows up in him. And, 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 and we're, we're supplying the very needs within the body. Much of, what's, of the weakness of the body is due to our separation. A 
according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You see, as we come together, or let me say it this way, to the measure or the degree that we come together is to the degree or the measure of our strength and our power. Wow. So the five ministry gifts are given until a specific time, until there's perfect unity, and then Jesus will take his bride away. We cannot attain this without all five ministries in place and operating. This presents a problem because for the most part we have ignored two of the most important elements of those offices in that list. In fact, in most churches today, if you look on staff, you'll, you'll see the, the, the first person listed on staff is a pastor. Amen. And then the second person listed in, on staff is some uh, churches list them as a, as a teacher or a teaching pastor. Because for some reason we have this hang up in the church about pastors. Did you know in the New Testament you only find the word pastor uh, a couple of times? Get your concordance out. I, 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 I want you to run a check. You find the word apostle mentioned over 80 times in the New Testament. And I think the word pastor is mentioned twice. You find the word prophet or prophecy over a hundred times. It's, it's an interesting study. So what I, I'm saying is, you know, while we're used in the church to having a pastor, we're, and we're okay with teachers, and even some churches have staff people who are... If, their sole purpose is evangelism. They are, the, they are the church evangelist. And they head up the outreach ministries of that church. But what's lacking in most of our churches is where, where's the prophet? Where's the apostle? And then even in the function of these ministries, we haven't even got the concept of their function right because the key word in Ephesians 4 here is for the equipping of the saints. Would you back up with me and look at it in verse 11? And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word perfecting there is the word equipping. So the, the, the main function of the five-fold ministry is an equipping ministry. In other words, you know what pastors should be doing? You know what a five-fold pastor should be doing? Producing pastors. A five-fold teacher should be teaching teachers to teach. A five-fold evangelist should be teaching how to evangelize. Whose responsibility is evangelism? Is it that is that one office of the evangelist? No. The calling and the commission was given to the entire church. The evangelist's responsibility is to raise up people, train the church to go out and win the lost. Just think how different it would be in our churches if people took that serious. Pastors should take care of people, yes. But you know, in my experience as a pastor, it's very easy for me to spend my entire time taking care of a flock and then ignoring my primary calling Because you know what's better than me just taking care of somebody? Raising up people who know how to care for the flock and just cloning myself. And then the excitement of finding those ones who do it and even do it better than I do. That, I'm like, I've been waiting for you. Because you see, every time I help someone come into their assignment, 
my assignment gets clear. Pastors are those who have the ability to shepherd the flock of God. Wait, wait, let's back up. I want, I, want to, I want to do this in the order. Actually, this is the reverse order of how they're given. Because I believe they're given in a list of, of priority. First of all, as we list it, number one is the gift of teacher. And it's someone who has the ability to go deeply into the Word of God, but not just to teach the Word, which a teacher loves to teach. But even greater than that is, is how that a teacher equips teachers to teach. Now, teachers ground people into the Word of God. Second, pastors are those who have the ability to shepherd the flock of God with great care and compassion and who in turn help engage members of the body to care for each other. It was never God's idea to have one man called the senior pastor to care for the church. The body has within it gifted people who need to be released and equipped into pastoral care. Pastors guard. Evangelists are those with the gift to win the lost. But more importantly, they recognize the need for all the church to walk in the calling to win the lost. Evangelism is not on the back of a certain gifted few, but this is the ability to call out and bring forth this anointing in all the church. Evangelists equip the body to evangelize. Evangelists gather. Do you see a pattern here? Grounding, guarding, gathering. Now there is an order to, the, to these gifts and how they are given. And I, I don't want to talk like a human here and, and, and reason in a linear fashion. Because we think in terms of importance. But God thinks in terms of power and priority. God's brilliance is seen in how he thinks. Remember, according to Isaiah 55, his thoughts are not our thoughts. We have been thought to think linearly like 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D. But God doesn't think in a linear fashion. His thoughts don't fall A, B, C, D. In fact, it's amazing how God works in his, in his goodness and his power. God works based on family values. And he works in terms of fullness. When you study God's work and you see it in the life of Jesus, who Jesus said of himself, he said, I only do what I see my father doing. That's a teaching that's of great value right now within the body too. But in the scene, this work of Jesus, we see that sometimes he healed people who weren't even in right relationship with God. But in his grace, he saw an opening and bestowed grace for healing. Then as a result of seeing God's goodness, they would fall on their faces, repent, and were completely saved. See, that messes up our theology because, first of all, we want it to be very linear. First, give your heart to Jesus. Then get your life cleaned up. Then get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then get filled with God and he'll heal you and he'll take care. You know, we just got A, B, C, D. And then God shows up and he messes the whole thing up. First, he healed people. Look at the woman at the well. He ministers to her. He, you see the gifts of the Spirit operating there. Jesus is reading her mail. Go get your husband. Well, uh, 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 you know, that, that's going to be a problem. He says, yeah, you're right because you, you've had like Buku's husbands and the one you're with now, uh -uh. And he's just ministering to her, pouring out and pouring into her and, and just reading her mail. And then before it's all over with, the woman gives her heart to Jesus. Then before she 
can you imagine before she gets even any training in evangelism explosion or anything, she goes back to her city and just starts telling everything God did for her and the whole city comes to Jesus because of a woman who got messed up and who got all that she got out of order. And you see, we're on the verge of that happening because God is ready to unleash his power, his anointing today. And we're going to see what we have never seen before. God is taking us where we have never been before. If, if things out of order bothers you, if you're ADHD in the spirit, if you are like, uh, you know, if you're like, if you just have problems with, with things being out of order, you really need to get a heart adjustment because God is fixing to turn things right side up. So the point here is this. That God is releasing something within the church, within the five-fold ministry. The point here is there's something wrong with a pastor who's not producing pastors. There's something wrong with an evangelist who is not producing evangelists. There's something wrong with teachers who are not producing teachers. In fact, there's something wrong with churches that are not producing churches. See, normally how churches get produced is this family gets mad at this family this faction gets set against this faction and we pull out and go up the road and we start another church which is built on an entirely wrong foundation and destined ultimately to fail because of the bad foundation. But then we say, well, you know, glory to God, God got a church out of it. Well, really. Because if that's your definition or your idea of a church, then maybe you need to get back to the Bible. Because when a church is functioning in New Testament Christianity, that church will have such life overflowing. It will have such an overspill of life that it will spill out and churches will be born as a natural result of the church's life that's spilling out of the community. And that's why the church has got to get... Get free from all this religious junk. We've got to get free from our concepts and our ideas, even the way we've held the gifts in our hands and said, God, you can do this, but you can't do this. And God says, watch me, because God is not going to be contained in our little box. He is not going to be contained in our theological mind. God is going to do what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, with whom he wants to do it, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. So this is why we need, this is why within the church, we need more than just a covering, but we must have accountability. This is why we need accountability. This is why the fivefold ministry has to come into a place and a level of real covenant relationship, because there's been a lot of mistrust from pastors to, uh, between pastors and evangelists. And then what about the fact that we've pretty much just ignored apostles and prophets because we're scared to death of them? Oh, you know it's true. And yet over the last several years, God has rebirthed the prophetic movement and shown us the need for the prophetic to rise up. In fact, he, we, I see today this prophetic element being, being motivated and used in a lot of people. But can I just tell you this? If God gives you a word... That does not make you a prophet. Any of you could give a word. And I would, I would recommend you not really seek the office of a prophet because prophets typically don't fare well in the church. Yeah, they kill them. So if you want that, have at it. But I wouldn't seek it if I were you. I would just say, Lord, if you could use me, but it, but it, but but I'm ready, I want to be used. But if you, if you are called to the office of the prophet, here's the thing, don't confer it on yourself. The church will acknowledge that gift in you. Self-appointed prophets, self-appointed apostles are never going to make it in this day, in this age. God called apostles are needed, and that's the next wave that's coming to the church. We've seen, the, we've seen the rebirth of the prophetic, 
Now what's waiting is a rebirth of the apostolic and God bringing the church back into an apostolic alignment. And so you see, I, I, in, in, in closing, <laughs> in the time I have remaining, I have to go really fast here. I want to address the apostles and the prophets really quick. Just as a, as a seed to sow into this ground because I believe that's what God is up to. I believe that's what God is here, uh, what he's doing here in this, in this realm that we're in. And, I, and, and, I, and you know, I want, to, I want to open my heart to what God is doing. I don't know exactly, I don't know exactly how it all is going to play out. But I know that as we keep pressing into him, God is going to set his alignment in order. And I gladly submit to the men that God calls to be the apostles over this region. I gladly submit to the prophetic, to the pastoral, to the teacher, to the evangelist, to see the will of God because I do not have a desire for a ministry of my own. What I'm looking for is this region to have Jesus show up and be Lord and let his glory fall on this region. And so I'm ready to wash their feet. I'm, I'm praying God reveal these, these men, these offices within the church in this region. Within the, within the world. The definition of an apostle is a Christian leader gifted, taught, commissioned, and sent by God with authority to establish the foundational government of the church. We know the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself be the chief cornerstone. Let me just say this in, in passing. If you reject apostles and prophets, you're rejecting Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone too. Well, that went over like a rat sandwich. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> they have the authority to establish the foundational government of the church within an assigned sphere of ministry by hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches and by setting things in order accordingly for the growth and maturity of the church and for the extension of the kingdom of God. I got that definition as the best one I, I've, I've, ever, I've ever read. And I've been studying this and looking at this, and that came from the writings of Peter Wagner, who you know is, is one of the fathers of this apostolic movement. What apostles do, they receive revelation, they cast vision, they birth, they impart, they build, they govern, they teach, they sin, they finish, they war, they align generations, they equip one need only read the book of Acts to see how apostles were doing foundational work and bringing order to what God was doing. If you want a good a cursor on apostleship, read Acts chapter 13. When uh, the, the, the Christians were dis dispersed out of Jerusalem due to uh, persecution, the work of God, the move of God moved to Antioch. And in Antioch, the, the church was born without any apostolic leadership. And when Barnabas showed up, he set things in order and even called Paul to come. And he set things in order in Antioch. And the church thrived and grew and, and became a hub for what God was doing in the earth to, in that day. And so that is, that is how important that the, the role of an apostle is within the church today. An apostle governs. An apostle governs. Prophets are mentioned second in the divine order, yet many are content to be a non-profit ministry. But in truth, God wants to hitch apostles and prophets together. God wants to hitch a prof a prophets and apostles together for a power team. I studied some time ago John Maxwell in his books on leadership, and I love the story he told about some Be Belgium horses in the county fair. He said the winner pulled 5,000 pounds and the runner-up pulled 4,000 pounds, one horse. But when they hitched them together, they both pulled 13,000 pounds together. 
And I believe that's what God is doing today. He's going to hit apostles and prophets, place them in the church. Get ready, church, because what's coming is a power team that's going to set the church in order. It's going to set things that have been out of order. If you will submit to it and you will have the right heart and the right spirit and the right willingness to work before God, God will show you his glory like you have never seen it before. This day of apostolic prophetic alignment is coming and you must submit and surrender to it or you'll get run over by it. Okay. Calm down, Mike. Thank you, Jesus. Prophets guide. All can prophesy. All can give divinely inspired, inspired utterances. But the fact that you can move in the prophetic does not put you in the office of a prophet. The office of a prophet is a distinct calling recognized by the church, and yet he is submitted to an apostle, willingly works alongside of an apostle to hear what God is saying to the church. The apostle then strategizes and set in order the word in order to see God's will done in a region or done in an area or done in a church as God's will is done in that area as it is in heaven. The prophet guides. This comes in foretelling and seeing future things unveiled. Or it can be simply a foretelling, revealing what God is doing at a given moment. There is also within the office of a prophet a strong ministry of correction. The church needs to be corrected. The church needs to be set in order. The prophet and the ministry of the prophet will set things in order in the church. The fivefold ministry has always been here. God is calling us to know it, to honor it, and submit to it. This will take a major shift, but everything that God is doing rides on our willingness to submit to what God is doing. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we just thank you tonight.